Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carl Meacham, and I am the uh, director here of the Americas program. Uh, I'm very happy that you were able to uh, come and join us uh, today. This is an event that's part of the CSIS Americas Brazil initiative, which seeks to engage uh, uh, you uh, here in Washington and around the world, the folks that watch us through the web on a series of issues uh, to improve under understanding on issues related to Brazil. Uh, as you know, today we're launching our latest publication, Brazil's Economic Identity, Motivations, and Expectations. Uh, the report can be accessed in PDF form on our website, csis.org forward slash Americas, and we've also posted it on our Facebook page and uh, on Twitter. Uh, I think it's a really great publication. I think that it does serve its purpose insofar as advancing understanding uh, with regards to uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil's role in the global economy, uh, in understanding its motivations, and we do some prediction in it as well. So uh, I recommend it to you, uh, to you all, and uh, I hope you read it. Um, and on that note, I'm lucky to have with us today uh, Dr. Canuto, Dr. Octaviano uh, Canuto, who's the senior advisor on the BRICS economies in the development uh, economics department of the World Bank. Um, as a discussant uh, of today's uh, paper, uh, um, we're really, really lucky to have him here. He previously served as the bank's vice president and head of the Poverty Reduction Network, uh, as well as the executive director of the bank's board. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, I know you have a very busy schedule uh, and you're doing uh, really important work. Uh, so he's ideal uh, for this launching today. As many of you know, uh, this week marks the sixth BRICS Summit hosted by Brazil in the city of Fortaleza. Uh, it brings together the heads of, of government and finance minister of the five prominent developing nations, um, India, Brazil, China, Russia, and South Africa. The importance of the BRICS to the global economy is self-evident. Uh, the group is home to 43% of the world's population, 30% of its land mass, 21% of global GDP, and 15% of global trade. In the past two decades, their share of global GDP has grown by some 150%. Uh, despite their relevance as a bloc, the group is often criticized for its apparent failure to yield any tangible results for its member states. Even its supporters recognize that the group's greatest strength is its opening regular channels of communication between the five countries. But uh, this latest summit uh, may have changed all of that. Uh, just yesterday, the five leaders announced that they agreed to establish their new development bank to be headquartered in China, run by the BRICS, and worth $100 billion. And keep in mind that the World Bank, the defining development bank, has a total worth of $324 billion. Uh, at the summit, Russian President Putin also proposed that BRICS set up an energy association to increase the energy security of emerging nations. This is not yet a done deal, but it's another step the group has taken to demonstrate that its potential extends far beyond communication. So it's interesting to see what's happening here. You're going from intention to action and possibly result. Uh, so the BRICS have made a clear statement in this latest summit. They mean business and they aren't to be taken lightly. In that context then it seems that now is the perfect time to shed some light on Brazil's own economic policy. Before I turn it over to Dr. Canuto so that he can provide his take on the role of Brazil in the BRICS in the global economy, I want to provide you all with a broad sense of what Brazil's economic identity is and how that influences its relationship with some of uh, its many uh, trade partners, which is the focus of our paper, right? Uh, perhaps the least understood of the BRICS, BRICS countries, at least in economic terms, Brazil has made itself increasingly relevant to global affairs, particularly over the last decade. It is no longer an optional market for the world's major players, but its economic motivations are, are ill understood still. Brazil, uh, Brazil's international economic relationships are guided uh, by its desire to consolidate and build upon its continued economic development. Rather than pursuing extensive bilateral free trade agreements, Brazil instead operates within the constraints of its involvement in the Mercosur and the World Trade Organization. 
Brazil's priority is to establish flexible, non-binding partnerships while developing new strategic partnerships in technology and manufacturing, all in the interest of furthering the country's development agenda. And Brazil's development <laughs> agenda and economic growth have, have been hard won. It wasn't until 1988 that Brazil began to open its economy to international competition, cutting tariffs, reducing redundancies, eliminating special import regimes, harmonizing taxation, and dialing back discrimination against foreign investors. In a lot of ways, the extent of the transformation in the early years of that shift cannot be overstated. Between 1988 and 1997, Brazilian exports grew by more than 57%, and its exports quadrupled. The volume of Brazil's total trade by 2012 stood at 26.5% of GDP, compared to just 15.2% two decades before. Because Brazil shares a border with 10 countries and has a diversified industrial base, historically, the country has maintained a strong presence in South America. But recently, Brazil's insertion in the global market is also growing, again, an integral part of the development agenda, of its own development agenda. In 2012, Brazil totaled 134 export partners compared to only 29 in 1990. Uh, in 1990, Brazil exported 1,642 different products. By 2012, Brazil, uh, that number had almost doubled to 3,022 products. Brazil's developing relationship with BRICS is also intriguing. Though the bloc has been the target of some criticism, its flexibility is very appealing to Brazil. The summit-style arrangement enab enables Brazil to identify those areas in which cooperation uh, would, be, would best suit its own development agenda and move forward from there. As far as the U.S.-Brazil relationship goes, there's very much potential, if only the two countries would seize on it. Despite the recent political disagreements that might indicate that things are cooling off between the two countries, the U.S. still has one of the most long-standing and robust trade relationships with Brazil. Between 2000 and 2011, Brazil trade, or bilateral trade between the two, uh, more than doubled. Unlike exports to China, where, uh, which are concentrated in raw materials, Brazil's trade with the U.S. is highly diversified. Intermediate goods account for almost 37% of Brazilian exports to the U.S., raw materials for 29% of capital goods, uh, and 20, uh, I'm sorry, uh, raw materials for 29%, capital goods for 20%, and consumer goods for 14. The United States also has a high degree of trade complementarity with Brazil, which associated with the size of its economy gives the U.S. an appeal that neither the BRICS nor the Mercosur can claim. But that relationship lacks a legally binding institutionalized framework that should uh, or that would shield bilateral relationship bilateral relations from political hiccups. Uh, a bilateral tax treaty, for instance, would increase incentives for Brazilian business to establish a stronger presence in the U.S. and vice versa. Uh, ultimately, what I hope you take from this event in the publication is this. An understanding of Brazil's economic strategy requires an understanding of their economic identity and the purposes of their policies. Brazil sees its trade and economic partnerships as channels to promote development, and the country is actively pursuing increasing engagement in international affairs, which also manifests in its economic relationships. But it's doing this on its own terms. Brazil has a lot to offer and also a lot to gain from its partners. The country can also serve as a bridge between the global north and south, both economically and politically. But bilateral relationships require confidence. So it might be time for the U.S. to try to mend the political damage uh, recent troubles such as the NSA revelations have caused. A gesture of goodwill from the U.S. might go a long way to do that. Opening the doors for maximizing the benefits of that relationship is important to both countries. So, with that, I think we're going to go to our speaker. The usual uh, rules apply. Uh, we're on the record and recording audio and video for the webcast, uh, webcast uh, on our website. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A period. Um, so when, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and a member of my staff will go to you. Uh, if you have uh, a question, it's even better. I know a lot of people might have opinions that they'd like to share, but please keep them brief. Um, 
I think that uh, these events are usually the best when they're conversational. So um, before we actually open it up to the q and I think I'm going to have a couple of questions with you and, and try to get your views and the essence of these arguments. So without further ado, uh, I want to welcome you all here. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's better? Yeah, yeah. better. Thanks indeed, Carl, for not only inviting me, but also uh, because I had the chance to read the report in advance, and I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, I think it's a very good uh, summary of key questions, and, and you propose a framework, and that's what I'm going to highlight here in my remarks. I'll try to be uh, as brief as I can uh, so as to maximize the time that we have for our Q&A. I will make three comments. Uh, first, I will comment on the, uh, the key bottom line of the paper, in my view, and uh, to highlight how spot on it is. Uh, then I will make uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, reflections and uh, issue a couple of opinions about the relationship of the BRICS, Brazil and the BRICS, especially with the, uh, on the outcome of the sixth summit that is concluding today. And then I will dedicate, thirdly, a couple of comments on using the basic thesis of the paper to uh, make my educated guess on how the relationship between foreign policy and development policy uh, will go, or tends to go in the case of Brazil, uh, next year onwards after the election. Okay, So that's my 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 target. Uh, well, first, on the key bottom line of the paper and why I think it is spot on. Um, at the beginning of the text, the report says, the paper seeks to bring clarity to Brazil's role in the global economy, its identity, self-perception, and what can be expected of it as we move forward. And then it concludes, Brazil's primary motivation is its own development agenda. Now, why I think this is quite an important conclusion. There are trade-offs between foreign policy and economic development goals. Uh, usually, the attention is, is given to the, uh, to the synergies or the win-wins between these two uh, realms of policies, right? Particularly when diplomats talk, they always tend to highlight, for obvious reasons, the win-wins, the, the, the connections. But the fact is that there are trade-offs. Uh, and the conclusion of the paper is, import is important because it highlights the fact that in the case of Brazil, the balance in this trade-off between foreign policy and economic development goals uh, tends ultimately to tip toward economic development goals. Given the history of Brazil, given the social structure, the relationship between state and civil society, given the DNA of the Brazilian political system, you will never find there in Brazil a sort of full and permanent autonomy of foreign policy goals. Uh, if you think this is abstract, let me compare two BRICS, three BRICS countries, Brazil with two other ones. Think of Russia in the case of Ukraine. The options and, and the directions taken by uh, Russian foreign policy have huge economic costs. Uh, nonetheless, they are made, which express, to some extent, a primacy of foreign policy goals vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, economic development goals. Uh, take the example of uh, China and, uh, and all the issues related to the relationship in the neighborhood and so on, and the islands in the Pacific. Uh, this has potentially economic costs. And uh, inside the Chinese system, one can gauge, even if we cannot observe directly, a, if not a confrontation, but a political dispute between the goals. You will not find anything similar in the case of Brazil. And I will give you a personal anecdote case, which I believe is very telling. When I was in the Brazilian government, I, uh, I was the deputy uh, at the Minister of Finance 
for international affairs, and one of my attributions was to head uh, the committee, the interministerial committee, responsible for approving the uh, operations of support to Brazilian exports through the BNDS with funding from the, the Brazilian Treasury and an in, in interministerial committee. And naturally, at the very beginning of Lula's government, there was a huge piling up of demands from abroad, from inside the country and from abroad. And of course, I was Minister of Finance. Uh, I was on the, the, on the Treasury side. And once in, in, in a meeting, I, uh, I observed that if we were to attend all demands on using the, uh, the support from the Treasury, there would be no budget space uh, to provide, to give, to implement social policies. To which one interlocutor replied by saying, foreign policy is as much important, if not more, than social policy. <laughs> and obviously, this interlocutor was wrong. <laughs> uh, and, and ultimately, uh, this, but this is a good example of how sometimes, very often, foreign policy and, and economic development policies do not necessarily conflate into a single unified win-win uh, situation. So uh, that's why, particularly in the, in the case of a country like Brazil, uh, the balance between these two types of goals tends to tip more in favor of the economic development one than it is the case in other countries. So uh, the, uh, the bot line of the paper is spot on. Uh, so if you want to look at uh, a natural corollary from uh, uh, the bottom line of Carl's, Carl's uh, report is look for domestic views in Brazil on the growth and development functionality of Brazil's foreign policy directions to gauge where the foreign policy tends to go, ultimately. Uh, any, let's say, apparent full independence of the foreign policy is not sustainable in the long run. So there's got to be a, 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 a certain order. So look at how domestically the different components of the uh, Brazilian political and, and, and social system uh, see the feedback loop uh, with the, the prevailing views of development to gauge to what extent that foreign policy is uh, to be sustained. So that's my first point. Second, on Brazil and the BRICS. And then you will allow me uh, the, the, the opportunity to, uh, to be a little bit provocative, <laughs> uh, tentatively. And I will, what I'm going to say, the, the points that I'm going to make, I will, I'm going to make them from the standpoint of a Brazilian who has worked in the Brazilian government and who has occupied for more than 10 years it's no longer the case, but uh, uh, senior positions in multilateral development institutions uh, headquartered here in Washington. Uh, I, work at, I was a vice president at the Inter-American Development Bank. I've been a member of the board of executive directors of the World Bank, and until recently, I was a vice president at the World Bank. And I will say the following. First, I see an asymmetry with which uh, people in Washington, G7, in fact, tends to uh, establish benchmarks of performance uh, for the BRICS grouping vis-a-vis, -vis, for instance, G7. There's so much talk about, wow, only five years later, the guys are presenting deliverables. Wow, how uh, these, these guys, these BRICS, they lack shared characteristics. The, the only thing they have in common is that they are big and middle income. That they don't have any shared geography. They have no trade arrangements on the negotiation. So there is no unity or purpose. Uh, well, why I'm saying that is this is very asymmetric vis-a-vis -vis the way one talks about G7. G7 is mostly a coordination uh, 
device. Uh, okay, everyone reads the, uh, the, the, uh, the outcomes in terms of uh, communiques, etc. And joint positions of these countries, as stated in the communiques, matter dramatically. They're quite important. But ultimately, none, none of these countries abdicates of their autonomy uh, when it comes to implementation of policies and taking decisions. And I'll give a couple of examples. Apart from the coordination uh, exercised, and it was very brief, on exchange rates uh, in the 80s, you don't have many other examples in that regard. Uh, think of, uh, of the reaction to the 2008 collapse of Lehman Brothers. Uh, well, there were the meetings here in Washington at the time of the annual meetings of the IMF and World Bank, there was such a, you know, you guys remember, those of you who were here at the time, all the frenzy and, and everyone was concerned with the abyss, and it was there, it was clear. But ultimately, the reactions came from each of the countries from there. Gordon Brown leaves Washington to announce his packages individually in England, not here in Washington. By the same token, what the Washington decides to do in the American case is not something that was agreed upon in the G7 meeting. And the coordination device functioned quite well because uh, along the discussions here, it became clear to everyone the huge danger, the huge abyss that was looming, uh, uh, waiting for everyone. But it's a coordination device. And talk and the conversation goes as far as helping the countries individually to take their directions. Let me give another example. Uh, and that's a provocative one. Uh, I have not seen any discussion within the G7 about, for instance, suspending the export ban uh, established on shale gas, uh, despite the, uh, the, 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 the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, and that's probably because there are country national objectives that go beyond this articulation. My point is that, uh, let's be honest, if one is to compare deliverables, results, and so on of other groupings of countries, let's be realistic that I, know of any, I don't know of any case in which there was abdication and subordination of national uh, priorities to some sort of grouping. Uh, so, uh, this issue of uh, deliverables and so on, uh, a same yardstick should be used. Uh, I think this reflects a bit, which is understandable, sometimes a, a mentality of us against them, or fight for hegemony. Uh, some discomfort with the idea of uh, a multipolar world. It's in, along my 10 years, uh, I, I still uh, very often, I, I hear people counterposing things like it's either the U.S. hegemony or them. No, the idea of multipolarity uh, means that you have action taking place with, uh, based uh, from different poles. It is no subordination. Simply, we in the world will have to live with that. And this is not good because uh, if you take one view such as this, us against them, or oh, they want to supersede us or not, then the side of complementarity, of cooperation, uh, is obliterated, is, is, is neglected. Which leads me to highlight exactly the complementary uh, possibilities with uh, the results of this summit. Look, there is a huge gap of long-run finance in the world. You, real, you, you read in the newspapers uh, and the reports of banks and so on about the huge capital flows to developing countries since 2008. And it's true. Uh, you look at the figures, the global figures, after uh, uh, a dip in 2009, 
business returned apparently as usual. And at some moment, it became, it became even uh, too much. Uh, that's when the Montega came with that thing of the currency war and so on. And if you look at this year, you look at the recent reports of the, internet, the IIF, and things remain looking you know, up. But when you break down the composition of these capital flows, you will note uh, that the bulk of it is bonds, acquisition of bonds. The bulk of it is, uh, and not long run bonds. You will see that the composition of this capital flows to developing countries, uh, the part that corresponds to long run lending and, and, the, and, and the presence of uh, private agents that complied, uh, that uh, occupied an important role in the past is no longer there. The, the, uh, the best example of that is the retrenchment of the European investment banks. And these banks were extremely important in the uh, early stage of uh, development finance in the past, or at least the finance of infrastructure investments. Because no one has to be a specialist here on, on finance to understand that any complex project of investment, like the ones in infrastructure, they go through phases. The, at the very beginning, uh, the, the, the relationship between uh, banks uh, and, and the, the investors cannot be an arm's length type. It has to be uh, the, the banks, the, the, uh, the, the, those financiers in the very beginning help to define the project in detail. They, they, they help solve technical details on the configuration of the project and so on. Only afterwards, when, particularly when the project it starts to be implemented and so on, is that bondholders come in. Mm. That's, namely, there is an initial stage in which the kind of finance is not the one that we uh, see as comprising the bulk of, of, uh, of finance, of external finance to developing countries nowadays. So if apparently there is a, uh, an abundance of uh, capital flows to developing countries, in fact, there exists a huge scarcity and, and a retrenchment of uh, real long-term basic development finance. Now, uh, and that's why one can see, attempting to fill this gap, the uh, rising emergence of uh, public development banks, sovereign wealth funds, resource-based finance, and new arrangements. It's, uh, it, uh, it's, it's a gap uh, that is humongous, and, uh, and it's been tentatively filled and, and not entirely filled by new agents coming in. And frankly, the existing multilateral development institutions don't have the size and they have made a huge effort. My boss, uh, the president of the World Bank, started implementing a program to make possible extending the financial capacity of the World Bank. And, and that's uh, a move in the right direction but not enough. So uh, the, the deliverables coming out of the Fortaleza uh, summit, uh, they not by chance include not only the new development bank, but also a protocol uh, among development banks of these countries. Uh, uh, there is also the currency reserve arrangement, but there's another thing that that's, that's an extension uh, of uh, existing bilateral uh, arrangements to share liquidity, like the Chiang Mai Initiative in Asia, like the bilateral uh, swap agreements that the Federal Reserve has with uh, central banks of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, some emerging market countries like Brazil and so on. So uh, the, the novelty is in this increasing collaboration and the NDB. Now, Gosh, I read the newspapers, and of course I've been flooded, we all have been flooded with uh, news since last week, 
uh, and, and since some time ago, and they all highlight the competition as if the major issue was the new development bank proposed to supersede the World Bank. Losing sight, in fact, of the, of the real problem, which is we need tens of NDVs. We need double World Banks. Uh, because uh, hopefully if we have these uh, multilateral organized ways to provide this long-term fi finance or the void will be filled with uh, experiments and, and other types of uh, finance that may carry more perils than, than, than these new ones. So uh, look at the Look at the complementarity side. Look at the, the high, huge need of long-term finance. Uh, and I mean the basic finance, that one that includes on the side of the, of the creditors, someone who helps the client to define better uh, their investment projects and so on. That's what we need. We need more development finance. Uh, also, the bilateral synergies. Uh, look, take the case uh, referring to Argentina, and I'm not talking. I'm gonna, not going to talk about uh, everything that led to the current situation and the the, the spat with the holdout creditors. Uh, I don't. I'm not addressing this. But as of now, and you're not going to talk about the World Cup either. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, only that the. Uh, uh, Brazil still has five cups. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing remaining. But it's better, it's better uh, uh, train better and observe what's happening in the rest of the world exactly. to be less <laughs> arrogant. Otherwise, we'll be superseded very soon. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> but the thing is, Argentina. It's going to take some time, even you know, and Argentina has been taking the steps uh, toward normalizing its relationship with the financial, uh, oh, you know, it start, restart negotiations with the Club of Paris. Uh, well, it, uh, after so, so much hustle, uh, managed to, to renegotiate the substantial bulk of, of its debt and so on. And then, well, now there is the holdout creditors, which will be. I strongly believe uh, solved uh, in the in the uh, in the near future. But in any case, it's going to take some time before Argentina gets full normalcy with respect to its relationship with financial markets. Now, and they have their vaca muerta. It's a terrible name, <laughs> that cow. But uh, but that's that's the name of the reserve of shale gas. And, and, and Argentina needs and can benefit a lot of, uh, uh, you know, untapping the resource and investing. So will Argentina have to wait until finally it normalizes its conditions with financial markets to start thinking of making that investment? No, if they can find other vehicles. So it's natural. And it's good for everyone. Uh, Brazil. Railroads. Uh, fortunately, there has been this awakening about the, the potential unexploited of using railroads in Brazil. And Brazil is getting late in the game and so on. Uh, do I see uh, many investors in the US interested in making huge investments in railroads in Brazil? Well. The Chinese have, because they have, among other things, the synergies that they expect to obtain with respect to the production of natural resource-based products and so on. So what's wrong if they, these guys enact their bilateral relationships? To the extent that uh, uh, what else, if we take the case of the US, for instance, there has been a declared selectivity in the, uh, in the hierarchy of, uh, of priorities regarding uh, its foreign policy. So my point is, accept the multipolarity, accept the complexity of the world, 
and, and adjust to it rather than simply see things and match things and attribute characteristics to things only on a binary, it's us or it's them. And I think, getting back to the paper, I like uh, uh, on page, page seven when Carl uh, says, the flexible BRICS format is the best case scenario for Brazilian engagement in the world. The summit style arrangement and its inherent malleability are what make the forum so appealing to Brazil. Through the summits, Brazil is empowered to identify those areas in which cooperation would best suit its own development agenda, promoting peer-to-peer -peer exchanges in those areas beneficial to Brazilian interests. Uh, they have opened regular channels of communication with potential partners and peers in every region of the world. And in his report, he, uh, he has the sessions on, on the several channels, in the case of Brazil, highlighting how much scope there is for synergy in all of them, including between Brazil and the US. So my second point is, uh, cease to be so much uh, G7 centered in the appraisal of uh, what's happening in these other poles of growth in the world. My third point, and I'm speaking longer than, than what I intended, is uh, there, uh, I will try to derive from, from, from Carl's uh, bottom line uh, some considerations about, some speculations about the future of uh, the evolution of foreign policy and its relation to development goals in Brazil. Well, one corollary of, uh, of the paper's main thesis is the following. As the global scenario evolves, and it's evolving fast, and as Brazil itself evolves, this leads to occasional and this will lead to a reappraisal and uh, adjustments in, the, in Brazil's foreign policy in the future. And I would highlight the, the following. The global setting is, is changing, really. If, and I'm establishing if, uh, significant plurilateral trade negotiations like TTIP and, and the TPP are signed, that changed dramatically the scenario if they are, if they are approved in a significant manner uh, with uh, important clause. Uh, also, see, uh, China and Mercosur. This is evolving. Look at the penetration of Chinese products in Mercosur. Look at the penetration of Chinese products in Brazil. Look at the, uh, the and, and by the way, uh, this description, you will find a good description of this uh, more intense relationship, trade relationship between Mercosur countries in China in the paper. The two pages dedicated to that. Uh, this puts into question and, and will oblige Brazil to review uh, the framework with which it has established its relationships with the global economy. Brazil itself, now looking at inside. As you all know, Brazil is uh, living through a soft spot, a soft patch, as far as growth is concerned, in the last few years. Basically, after the growth spurt in, of 7%, above 7% in 2010, uh, growth rates have been uh, too low uh, since 2011. And this year uh, is not going to be much better. Uh, and this reflects to a large extent. Uh, we have written uh, a lot about this. I uh, wrote recently a piece with my colleague, Philip Schlack, and who's here. And, uh, and, and the point is that clearly a successful and meaningful, particularly in social terms, growth period uh, that the country lived through in the new millennium is gone. Uh, don't measure the success of the Brazilian growth performance uh, in the 2000s simply looking at GDP figures. Look at the bottom of the pyramid. This is a very well told story. I will not uh, spend time here on it. But uh, the rates of growth of income at the bottom of the income pyramid in Brazil were at Chinese levels. 
But that was then, at the moment when, in terms of trade, when the price of, uh, of commodities w w were r r rising, and, and any country rich in natural resource becomes richer by gravity, simply, without doing anything, simply because uh, when its natural resource uh, have their price going up. But also, given the bold policies of raising minimum wages and also the more uh, cost-effective social policies implemented in Brazil, that led to a process uh, of growth, a significant growth, particularly if, uh, if one looks at the bottom of the pyramid, that yielded uh, meaningful fruits, but that had a limit because at a certain moment, uh, even if the rate of investment to GDP was coming up since the, uh, after the lows of 2003, 2002, 2003, it didn't rise enough to sustain and to keep the, the momentum of, uh, of the economy uh, and, and the consumption-led growth exhausted. And the, and the, the country has been on a, on a now on a slow pace toward uh, attributing a higher weight to investments, which is more easily said than done. And one may, and that's when, and I, I, I will not give here any statement on whether this movement has been too slow or, or, or adequate. Yeah? See, so we will not gauge what will be my positioning in the coming elections. <laughs> But the point is, some things have been done, some others need to be done. And, and there is an increasing perception, that's what I have, that's what I gauge when, every time I go there and when I talk to people there, that uh, things will have to change with respect, for instance, to the trade relationship in Brazil. The popularity of uh, trade protection is going down. Private sector entrepreneurs are adapting themselves. If, if, you, if you look at the... Uh, at the uh, VAT, the value-added tax, uh, applied on, on manufacturing activities in the state of Sao Paulo, you will note uh, uh, he, uh, strong statistical correlation between the VAT uh, uh, revenue on the one side and on the other, the penetration of Chinese imports. And that's not by chance. The Brazilian, the manufacturing industry is already adapting itself, despite the protection, to a world in which uh, the existing framework of protection will not exist. And you can see uh, increasingly voices questioning the protective way by which uh, the manufacturing industry was protected. I'm not saying that the unfolding of this will be any sort of, a, of a trade in lateral movement, but I can tell you that things are changing down there. And also, to go back to my uh, first comment about the trade-offs between foreign policy and, and economic development. BNDS. BNDS funding, differently from other uh, countries like China, uh, or Russia and so on, has to come from Treasury. And uh, no matter who wins the election, it's my view, uh, review of the public spending and, and some budget adjustment will have to take place. And there will be not much scope for doing uh, foreign policy through the BNDS. Uh, <coughs> it will have to adjust to a, a new reality. So things are changing there. Things are evolving. And following, to finalize, to conclude, following exactly the, 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 the lead proposed, the way proposed in the paper uh, prepared by Carl, uh, it's the economy, stupid. Look at the economy there to gauge whether it will lead to reappraisals of foreign policy goals because that's the nature of the relationship between, that's the identity, the economic identity of Brazil as well captured in the report. Thank you. Great. Oh, uh, one, one last thing. To, to uh, 
if we want to have an idea of uh, how the changing global environment is bringing implications to Brazil, I would recommend a report that has been released this week and is available through the World Bank website, prepared by a team led by Philip Slackens, which is exactly implications of a change in China for Brazil, a new window of opportunity. That we may as well some other day discuss here if you feel like. Thank you. Good. So you get two reports for one here. That's great. That's great. So look, you've, you, you were extensive and comprehensive, and I think everybody was uh, interested and engaged in what you had to say. I don't want to take a lot of time in asking a lot of questions, because I think some people are going to want to ask their own questions. But there's one thing that I do sort of want to ask you uh, before I open it up uh, to, uh, to uh, questions from, from the audience. You said that it was good to have more development banks. And I think, I think few people would disagree that there's a need to have more availability of funding and technical assistance to help those in need. But I want to go and drill a little bit deeper. What are the effects of an active new development bank for the World Bank? And you touched a little bit on this with BNDS. And how does it work with Brazil and BNDS and its involvement in a new development bank? And the last question that I'd ask you um, would be policy coordination. Um, if the countries of the BRIC, if the BRIC countries get together, and this actually means policy coordination for development, that's a different. That's a whole different uh, okay. sort of game. And I would ask you if this actually would also mean um, new areas, such as energy. I know President Putin was talking about some of these things within the BRICS, but also uh, in some of his visits to other countries. So uh, those are my questions. Okay. And, and then we'll open it up to, to folks in yeah, the audience. Pretty good ones. Uh, the first one. I don't see these institutions disputing the same market. They will have necessarily different, different uh, features, different capacities. Uh, the World Bank has uh, an enormous, important, accumulated knowledge and experience with development. And uh, whereas by its own nature, it is not and I may be crucified for that, but uh, it, it, everything has a trade-off. Its safeguards, which are important because they are a benchmark for everyone, make disbursements, for instance, slower than what these more direct institutions can provide. I know that. I work at the IDB, uh, and, and uh, the IDB is quite close in that regard to the World Bank, but I also watched the... Uh, the uprise of uh, Corporación Andina de Fomento, uh, which it now calls itself Development Bank of Latin America. Yeah. Since it came out from the Indian countries and, and, and incorporated Brazil and Argentina and so on. These institutions, they have different features. So uh, depending on, on the attitude of uh, shareholders and, and their management, they can cooperate. Take the, the uh, World Bank, IFC. The, in my view, the, uh, among the most impactful projects supported by the IFC, the private sector arm of the World Bank, are the ones in which the IFC works as a catalyzer mm -hmm. to, to bring in syndicated lending from private banks. Uh, in, in many other projects, the World Bank cooperates. Think of the involvement of the World Bank which was minimum as compared to the size of the venture with the Panama Canal. Uh, it was so huge. And the World Bank worked with the IDB. And, and so my point is uh, the institutions can act complementarily. For instance, uh, it, it's there at the, at the memorandum, I think I read it in the memorandum, that the currency reserve arrangement, for instance, uh, its use will require the program with the IMF. Mm -hmm. So it's stated there, which is an acknowledgment 
that these, these uh, new institutions don't have to try to supersede and, and, and duplicate what has been built in, in, in the existing ones. So uh, I, I stick to the view that there is more scope for complementarity rather than, than, than competition. Mm -hmm. And as far as policy coordination, what do you see? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I see uh, more, uh, at least as of now, mm -hmm. more of uh, an intense network of bilateral relationships. Okay. Okay. Like an example that I gave on, on Vaca Muerta in Argentina, okay. uh, more than, than anything else. And in energy, well, Vaca Muerta is energy. Uh, whenever uh, there is something, there is a book for the bank yep. uh, in, 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 in the two countries. Okay. Okay. Let me open it up uh, to questions. Wow, there's a lot. Um, okay, so we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to take two, and we're going to let you answer it, and then we'll take two more uh, after that. So why don't we start here up front? Ian, if you can. Yeah, there's also there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There so we're going to go two, and then two. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Jennifer Chen with Xinjiang Media Group. My question is, so how do you see the setup, the, the new uh, development going to affect the World Bank, especially is there any policy change, possible policy change in World Bank in the future? Thank you. Okay, there's one. Uh, and we're just going to yes, two. Yes, and yes, yes. Yeah. And the lady here. Hi, uh, I'm Jennifer Lee with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Also a question about the BRICS banks. I wonder, um, do you think what's the significance of the BRICS bank, given there's a discussion that the size and economy, the five countries' size and economy, or their motivation, even the region, are very different, so that it will pose challenge on the policy coordination or the resource allocation in the future? And the second one is also it's a follow-up question. Do you think how the World Bank can help the BRICS banks so that they can complement each other. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 great. Uh, this gives me the, the chance to repeat the caveat. I'm speaking here on a personal basis. I'm not representing the World Bank. I'm uh, just uh, a clerk, like, uh, <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> but yeah, I'm no longer even vice you're president. A, you're I'm just a worker. Uh, yeah, just a worker, a yeah. senior advisor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and in institutional positions have to reflect management and, and the board and so on. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, in my opinion, there's no, no reason why a new policy has to be enacted. What certainly has been already expressed by my boss is the, the World Bank preparedness to cooperate. He has said this through several vehicles. And I think, the, the, and in my view, the feeling uh, in the institution, in management is this: ready to, ready to, to rock and roll. Uh, on dimensions, uh, people have focused on the size of the initial capital, uh, which I think it is a wrong focus. How come? Uh, would these countries uh, have to build? Uh, how long did it take, in the case of the World Bank, to reach the proportion that it has? Uh, it took long. Uh, the, the initial capital uh, subscription can obviously be adjusted upwards as it goes. I think uh, having the size that, that was defined is like stepping a stone at the time. Doesn't that come, does that sound familiar? <laughs> crossing the river st uh, stone by stone. So uh, it, it's the bucket for, for uh, 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 an initial stage. And again, it is not in detriment to other, other initiatives, like the Asian Infrastructure Bank, like the expansion of the Development, Development Bank of Latin America that I was mentioning, like the, the, uh, the expansion of the activities of the national development banks of these countries. And, and you, you, your question was on the help. How could? Uh, uh, the World Bank particularly, I would say, uh, making available the experience, the knowledge acquired, uh, and, and, and the terms of this cooperation is something to be defined as it goes. 
two folks over here. You? No. I, I have a, a, he's a member of the, uh, the board <laughs> yeah, of executive oh. directors of the World yeah. Bank. <laughs> and I don't want to be, I represent Portugal at the World Bank. I'm a <laughs> colleague and friend of, uh, of uh, Ottaviano. So um, I was, um, you know, a uh, brilliant intervention as always, but uh, uh, a couple of comments and questions that were inspired by what you said. Uh, I find the frame, you know, the idea of relationship between economic development and foreign policy very interesting, especially the comparisons between what happened in Brazil and the examples you gave uh, between comparing Brazil with other BRICS and uh, the tension that may exist. And that led me to, th you know, think a little a step further that, of course, I agree with you with the complementarity and the need for all development finance needed, and that, you know, the BRICS Bank will complement the World Bank, so... But, as you know, the devil is in the, uh, in the details. And so, uh, sometimes, when you're going to discuss investments, environmental safeguards, you know, uh, uh, respect for some uh, indigenous people's rights, uh, you know, sometimes, Tensions arise between cultural values, uh, foreign policy, and economic development. And so, um, although you know, I, you know, the, as the BRICS Bank will uh, certainly um, uh, get into action, we may see those uh, difficulties. We know that the Bretton Woods institution don't engage in political issues or in human rights, but we all know that, you know, in several areas, environmental safeguards is the typical one, you know, there are ingrained values and uh, that, that one could call universal that are not necessarily uh, seen the same way in everywhere in the world. So I just yeah. wanted to throw this and um, And the second one is just a, a little bit of a provocation. I noticed a little slip of language when you said that the, the world at some point I think the global arena is evolving fast, and Brazil is evolving. And I noticed that on the second part, the fast <laughs> wasn't really there. So I um, I follow your diagnosis, and I'm I'm, I'm always I've, I've been agreeing with you. So how do you think uh, that emerging consensus of more openness, debureaucratization? you know, uh, inserting Brazil in the global value uh, chain, you know, how fast will that consensus impose itself in the independent of political right. results uh, in the Brazilian society? Um, and uh, what is your evaluation of that? And, uh, you know, are we going to just, uh, since we are in Washington and using Rahm Emanuel, are we going to need a crisis or right. since a crisis is an opportunity too good to be wasted, so right, okay. I'll just leave and, and that in the air. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Here, right over here. All right. Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Wells. I'm an expert in the Russian language internet. Can you discuss Brazil's natural gas industry, the state of the infrastructure for moving it relative to other Latin American countries? Thank you. Uh, could you repeat? But, uh, I, I could you discuss Brazil's natural gas industry? Okay the state of the infrastructure for moving it, especially relative to other Latin American countries. Yes. Thank you. Great. We'll do those two. I think we're going to do two more. And I think there's a tweeted question. And you know we've gone a little bit over, so I appreciate you being willing to uh, go over. OK. No, That's a question. <laughs> no, yeah, we, we can go. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, we so can I think we're going gonna to take two more after that and the tweeted question, and I think then we'll wrap Fantastic. up. Is that OK? Yes, perfect. Great. Yeah. Uh, on the first question made by uh, Dr. Monte Pinto, uh, two, I agree with you. Uh, cultural values, uh, assessment of uh, safeguards, on the, on the one hand, they may differ in practice. True, one has to consider. And what can be done about it? Live with it. Because there is no way the old guard would be able to impose. On the positive side, uh, the experience has, uh, we have all learned with experience, including countries that were skeptical about those safeguards 
how in the long run it pays off to follow these safeguards. Think of environmental safeguards. Uh, even, uh, let's say, countries or, uh, that were not paying due in attention to, uh, now they're feeling the price of it. So I'm optimistic that the safeguards will prevail, the good ones, uh, as long as the experience shows, has shown, and, they, and the experience has shown how they pay off to all of them. So I would be less uh, afraid in that regard because of this, uh, this propensity. Uh, environment is the typical case, right? Uh, on, on will Brazil need a crisis to, to really speed up the process of transformation? Uh, not necessarily, and why is that? Because to some extent, the Brazil is already, if not in a crisis, but it has been undergoing uh, uh, a long process of low growth. And that start, had started to, to bother and to be taken into account that something needs to be done. Secondly, to be honest and to be, uh, to be, uh, you know, law, to be correct, uh, the, the, the government, for instance, the incumbent government, has already been evolving and taking uh, steps on that direction. Some of the Brazilians say it should have gone faster, but as some others will say, well, it took the time that it was necessary. But think of how the framework for the participation of the private sector in infrastructure evolved dramatically in the last few years. Uh, until we found, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the government has looked for a model of concessions in which the government abdicated from capping the rates of return and abdicated from some of the, of the uh, uh, measures of before. So the government evolved. Uh, think of the lay of, uh, law of, or, of or ports. Gosh, we could have got there a long time ago. But, uh, but the reality is that interest fought against it, and, but we got there. So I think there is already an underlying transformation. This year is not, uh, uh, as, as it happens everywhere, election years in a democracy are not uh, years in which one may expect dramatic change because, because of the political uh, embeddedness of the process. But uh, independently of who wins the election, there will be an agenda of transformation uh, that will impose itself uh, to the Brazilian government in the, in, the, in the future. So hopefully no full crisis will be necessary. And in infrastructure, uh, the Brazil has, has lagged behind uh, dramatically vis-a-vis, -vis, even vis-a-vis -vis other uh, countries, well, developing countries, emerging markets by far, but even in the region. Uh, I would say that infrastructure investments is the easiest pick uh, if, the, if the country wants to raise the growth rate in the following few years. Because there is the drag on, on Brazilian growth uh, coming from the absence of infrastructure investment is so heavy uh, that uh, the lousy state of the Brazilian infrastructure uh, already takes a huge toll, a heavy toll, on the productivity of the private sector. We're talking about the natural gas specifically. Uh, yes, natural gas and all the others, uh, natural resources in general. Uh, I'll talk about Petrobras. And Petrobras, I, I, I use, I use, I can point it out as an example of the evolution that I was referring to in my response to, to Nuno Mota Pinto, namely, uh, the overhype after the discovery of the pre-salt oil layers and so on led to some hubris and to overburdening of Petrobras. Suddenly, Petrobras had to simultaneously collaborate with uh, the fight against inflation, had to, uh, through suffering a loss by having the price of gasoline, uh, having a lid on the domestic price and so on, Petrobras also was obliged to, to, to help uh, through uh, the, the local content policy, which implied led to a toll on Petrobras. And Petrobras also had to 
overextended financially in order to participate in all uh, pre salt oil ventures. Oh, that uh, stretched Petrobras. Uh, little by little, this has been partially reversed. The, the local content policy has been slackened. The, uh, the, 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 everyone knows that the gasoline price will have to, you know, uh, it's one of the administered price that will be adjusted last year, next year. Uh, namely, the, the, the tapping of natural resource, uh, including natural gas, will uh, depend a lot on, on whether the agents that can lead this process are recapitalized and, and, and can perform this job. I think we're going to go to the last group of questions, uh, and there's lots of hands up. So what I will do is we will just go through the questions, and you're going to pick which ones you want to answer, OK? okay. So um, <laughs> if we had a microphone up here, the three questions that are up here and one question up here, I don't think we'll have time for the tweeted question. So why don't we start here? Thank you. I actually wanted to follow up on, on the energy question. and. Um, thinking of where the Brazilian economy stands today and the levers or opportunities that Brazil will have in order to revamp its economy, uh, I think that you know you just mentioned the pre-salt. So I was wondering what is your view on potential changes in regarding the pre-salt legislation, particularly to increase the speediness or the level of development in the pre-salt, which would be a, a great lever. To, to revamp the Brazilian economy, and particularly given the current changes that we're seeing in other parts of the yeah. region, particularly with Mexico. So I was wondering on your views on that. Good. Right. Cito? Great. Cito, oh, no. well, then we yeah. can go through. Go, go for it. Yeah. Um, so my question was going to be about. Can you identify yourself? Just right. So I'm Hamza Farouk. I'm a student from Williams College okay. um, doing econ policy. Uh, my question was, um, given that many of these BRICS countries, and I'm talking particularly about China and India per se, um, you see a lot of development, but at the same time, there are vast expanses of poverty as well. Um, and a lot of people have not really benefited from the trickle-down wealth that was imagined that would come with this development. So do you think with the construction, with the setup of this new development bank, or um, with these newer conferences happening, is there going to be a shift in the focus so that not only are macro indicators indicative of the macro development, but also incorporate um, levels of poverty in that development? Okay. Thank you. Good question. Ciro? Uh, uh, Ciro, uh, Embassy of Brazil. I just have a quick question uh, about the interactions of uh, economic and uh, domestic economic policies and, and foreign policies. And I agree with Dr. Canute that uh, this can be observed in other countries as well. Um, don't you think that uh, these interactions uh, could be seen in Brazil internally? I mean, Brazil is a very big country, it's complex. Um, for example, the importance of uh, policies of uh, social inclusion, or uh, you have the case of uh, industrial policies, for example. Sometimes in the paper, perhaps, you could see a stronger link between industrial policies and, and exports. But you know, in Brazil, uh, industrial policies can be used to uh, other goals. You have the importance of uh, domestic investment, for example. Uh, it is also mentioned uh, industrial policies in the context of high-tech firms, but industrial policies in Brazil can be used, for example, to support a small and medium enterprise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question in the back. Good afternoon. I'm Elias Leon with the NAFTA and Trade Division of the Embassy of Mexico. So after examining the concept of economic identity, you say that Brazil has a lot to gain and offer, both economically and socially. So how do you think Brazil can ultimately achieve its needs and confidence vis-a-vis -vis the BRICS group? Thank you. OK. OK, all great questions. Yes, 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 they are. And of course, we could go on here on the energy side uh, there's so much, and, and that's one of the strongholds of this institution. And uh, I'm, I'm walking here on a minefield. I, I think we're going to have to invite you back. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but certainly the following. The, the scenario has changed since 2008, obviously. 
uh, you forgot to mention the U.S. shale gas, right, and the impact on the world price. So much of the, uh, the hype associated with the pre-salt oil uh, uh, and gas has diminished because there are other producers. Mexico is doing the right thing, is untapping its potential, and so on. But still, uh, regardless of the political risk associated with uh, Ukraine and, and the Middle East and, and, and Iraq and so on, I don't know of any forecaster to be saying that the price of oil and gas will slump. The shale gas revolution has been very good for the, America, for the US. Uh, it is not something that is easily exportable. I can't conceive of Europe having their dense uh, urban space being overwhelmed with uh, just to produce gas or shale gas. Uh, so it's, not in a, uh, it's very good for America, but I, I, I don't foresee a slump of price of oil and gas. There, will, there has been a reevaluation. So uh, the, the investments in pre-salt oil will adjust accordingly. Now, one important thing, of, uh, and I forgot to mention it, it was a collateral damage of the anti-inflation task attributed to, uh, to the Petrobras uh, with the, the artificial lowering of, uh, the, of the domestic price of gasoline. The biofuel industry suffered a blow. Uh, so it's not only the issue of the, 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 the price of gasoline. There are other issues as well, the adaptation uh, the adaptation of the industry to, uh, to the entry of, uh, of, of uh, foreign investors interested in short-term profit maximization. That led to bad policies of renewal of sugarcane uh, fields and so on. There is also the fact that the learning curve of the automation of, automation of the production process is still, but basically the blow on the, on the sugarcane industry, on the biofuels industry, has been a collateral damage from the, the, the... Look at that, because it's not going to save, let's say. But uh, the, the share of uh, bioenergy, bioelectricity, can certainly raise, uh, rise uh, two or three percentage points in the next five years. Uh, that's what I, I hear from the pundits. Uh, so. Certainly, the, the prospects are being reevaluated given the, 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 the change. On China and India, I agree with you. Uh, I don't think it is, well, in, in Piketty times, people only focus to inequality. But when it comes to China, it's, it's true the inequality has increased, as it always happens in, in the growth. Uh, patterns like the Chinese one, but what, what on the other hand, the number of people lifting above poverty levels has been humongous. So China is a success as far as poverty reduction is concerned. That's not the same case in India, and it will aptly uh, point it out. Uh, for that to happen in India, some structural reforms will have to take place. I will, I will tell you my favorite one, the one where I would put my bets. Uh, it's in the labor market regulation. It's inconceivable that a country with a potential like, like India has, uh, not only on the top of the uh, scale of capacities uh, in some areas like telecommunications and service and, and science and so on, uh, while China is losing competitiveness in labor-intensive uh, segments of manufacturing industry. It's inconceivable that these, these, the transfer of these production processes has gone to countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, some, some spots in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. But as India who could use this as an opportunity to make the after Lewis transition, what other developing countries have done, which is exactly to generate jobs, employment for a huge part of the population. But for that, 
uh, the labor market cannot be as it is today, over-regulated and, and, and so on. So my point, I agree with you, uh, but it's up to the countries uh, to take the decisions uh, and to implement the process of structural reforms that the country needs. Which leads me to the answer to your question. No, not the New Development Bank. You know, I will tell you something that I may regret saying it, but I can't, I can't hold it. <laughs> I, I'm getting too old. Uh, you guys who never worked at the, those of you, particularly the young people, who never worked in a multilateral institution, you guys overestimate the power of these institutions. You really believe that the NDB or the World Bank uh, will rule the roost in telling the countries what to do in Calvanite? Yeah. Well, small countries, uh, particularly in the past, when they needed the IMF money, then they would have to do whatever the IMF told them to do. But this is no longer the case. <laughs> So don't put your hopes on, uh, but when we are, well, when I was younger, all the science fiction movies that I watched, <laughs> that came, they all had when a Martian landed uh, here on Earth, take us to your leader. And then the Martian was taken to the UN, right? And it, it had, I, I was raised with this idea, that's where the world uh, will head to. Uh, but, it, it's, but it's only in movies. Uh, <laughs> right. Industrial policy, uh, yeah, you know, uh, with the tag of industrial policy, you see it all. You see technology, you see sheer protection, you, you, you see uh, 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 interests and so on. You see uh, rent seeking and so on. My point is that it's a mixture, it, it may be wishful thinking, but is that all these industrial policies, they are costly. They end up implying in a, in a toll paid by the, the public at large, either through taxes or through paying more for uh, uh, goods and service. Uh, and this means that uh, the bill got very high. So inevitably, uh, there will have to be some selectivity. Uh, no, no, no matter who wins the election, I strongly believe that there will be a screening out of the current state of uh, yeah. things that are there with the tag of industrial policy to check out which ones really have performed well, which ones really uh, are justifiable either for poverty reduction reasons or for helping with, with economic progress and which are not. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think I, I, I think you've covered everything. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you. you yeah. Know, for, on Mexico. For, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you see, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Because I uh, I follow very closely. Uh, I I I love Mexico. I have many Mexican friends, and I worked with Mexico uh, and the IDB, and in Mexico is doing the right thing, which is incomplete. Uh, Mexico has done a fantastic job on the macro side, has done a fantastic job on the human capital uh, side, is performing uh, reasonably well. It has uh, done a good job as well, of obviously, in trade integration. Uh, but it has not eliminated the bias that is in, 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 uh, embedded in the incentive system. Uh, against the extension of the formal side. The, the challenge for Mexico is to increase the degree of formalization. So as to, Mexico today has exhibits two paces of growth, the one of the formal modern side and the one of the traditional side. Mexico has to, to make sure that the formal side grows and absorbs the informal one. If Mexico managed to do that, it can raise up its income and, and reach top levels. A little bit more of, of uh, attention to social policies. Excellent. So thanks for answering, for, for supporting the report, and for giving your opinions on all these things. All Thank right. you so Thank much. Thank you. A real pleasure.